we're going to see here that there's a, some contradictions in this whole use of the using the anointing oil that uh what do you call it that uh, that that's Rambam's a little bit inexact in this in these halachas. My personal belief is, you know, maybe we follow. If you ever find a machlokas Rambam and Rambam Mishnah Torah, you follow the later chapter. Why? Because he wrote it over. He wrote it over the course of a few years. You know? And you also. Right, look, yeah. I just finished studying the Rav Kapach's translation of uh, of the uh, Parish of Mishnayis. Rambam says it at the very end. It says, "Yeah, it took me a few years. I started in this year and I completed it in that year." And he writes about, you know, in his introductions to things. And the Sefer Mitzvah says, "I'm going to start writing this Mishnah Torah thing. I have a whole plan what it's going to be like." And uh, yes, yeah, so it was a uh, it was quite a quite an adventure, you know. So to think that perhaps he got to more. You know, he planned it out, but whatever he wrote toward the end was, I guess, uh, his final version. Anyways, hold on. I'm going to mute myself so I could listen to this message. Okay, we're back. We're still waiting for the guys, so I'm going to continue over here. Last week, you mentioned that the uh, vowelization for Mechon Vamare is weird. So I wanted to ask, where do they get it from? Is it some strange Tawani Masoret that they have, or did they just make it up? Or... I, I don't think they made it up. There is basis. Look, um, why don't we look at, why don't we just uh, to convert one of these into uh, uh, the Tiamani version? Because I always use their undotted version, by the way. Which, by the way, the undotted version doesn't exactly fit that of the Rambam's Kis Vayad. Why? Because they added a lot of Vavs and Yuds, of course, as is their practice. So, um, ooh, I went to the wrong page. Let's see. Where did it say? Kipus Batar, Mishnah Torah Lulunikud, Mishnah Torah Minutat. Here we go. So, Mishneh Torah Loha Rambam. Okay. Notice over here, this is already not traditional. They put a kamatz here. I would think actually that makes more sense. Why would, well, what's the nafka mean if it's a kamatz or a patach? There, I'm not sure. So usually if you're dealing with, when we do with acronyms in Hebrew, it's just patachs basically. But mm -hmm. because this becomes his name, most uh, proper nouns in Hebrew, when you, when you convert, when you have a proper noun, the active, active closed syllable has more likely a kamatz and a patach. And this is most uh, visible when you have uh, a verb like a natan or a saf or shafak uh, present in the name. So sometimes those are just, that's just the name. Natan, asaf, and shafat are actual names in the Bible. And then sometimes you have Yehoshaphat or shafat, yahu, uh, et cetera. You, and you make it a theophoric name. Theophoric means you attach God's name to the name. Right. And, in all those cases, whereas the actual verb is, uh, is, is vocalized with kamat and pata, shafat, nothan, when it becomes a person's name, suddenly it's always, both are kamatsin. It's, a, it's always <laughs> a proposal form. So welcome. You're welcome to have the pizza. I try to keep it hot for you guys. Is, uh, is David coming? Is someone else on the way also stuck? Who wrote it on the group? Uh, yeah, not David. Yeah, I don't think so who was it? There was someone else stuck on the bus. Hold on. Leon uh, Shmuel's here. You remember him? Bigly. Leon? Oh, Josh. Okay. Hi, Shmuel. Hi. Who are you? I don't know. Who are you? Doc was here, Rabbi too. Grossman said I remember you. Yeah. Well, were you guys roommates or something? Okay. Um, you've met Yoni? He spells his name with an I. 
Well, it's an onion pizza this time. That's what they had. I wanted to do the chillin', but you know. Okay. So you, you tried to get another. But that's, it's kind of hard. It's hard to look out here. Okay. Um, so if you're gonna wash, you should wash. Now we're gonna get yeah. a little bit. But yeah, tell me how it how it goes. And when you guys are done, you could unplug the blech. Yeah. Okay. So um, we're looking at the nikud over here. So I understand why it is that they would buck the trend and make it uh, kamatz. Over here, this is basically a no sach. Okay. Um, te moniim. So you look over here. See that? Yeah. Yeah. T why is that? Most people say te mani te moniim. They wrote te moniim. See? Let's say right. Mm -hmm. um, let's see what else. Okay, this is mostly normal. Let's see. Did you know? Did you yourself notice any that looked kind of weird? Yeah, they spell Kotel with a patach under the under the top. They wrote Kotel with a, with a kamatz with a kamatz under the top. They, it's no, I didn't or that. something. That's interesting. Here we have Hilkot instead of Hilkot. That's not locus. Why is it Darche and Malche? They don't have a dugation in, in the cuff. Shouldn't it be uh, considering that um, ma, the Lamid has a Shvanach and uh, with the man it creates one one closed syllable, it should be Malke, right? Same with Hill Kot. It should be, should be a cuff with the dugation, not. So this makes more sense, but it's it bucks the trend, that's all. Let's see. Here we Kiryat. See Kiryat? Yeah. Kiryat Shema. It's the Kriya, it's the it's the it, it's the spichud. It's the, the um, it's the construct form of the word kiria. There should be a shiva here and a chirik under the resh and the I mean, and uh, you know the aleph is missing also. Kiryat is the is apparently the construct form of the word kiria, which is a type of city. Kiria ne'amana, right? Yeah. Also, kohanim here is spelled Malay. Throughout the Torah, kohanim is mostly spelled without the the, the vav. When in Ketiv Malay, there's no, there's no uh, love there. Okay? So that's also a strange thing that they do. Um, oh, Rabbi, just so yeah. you know, I always sit here because I, I do really loudly. It's okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
and stood on a ladder right in the middle of the hall and smashed the vase right in the middle of the floor. So it scatters into pieces. And now you have people along the edges of the hall are going to pick up some of those pieces, you know, because it goes in all these different directions. That was basically how the Masora worked when the Jews were exiled. So every Jew, every group took away a different part of the truth. Yeah, and they had to compensate for it. Now we have to put it back together using our minds and debating and, and looking into things to try to figure out how things actually work. Even Professor Kahn, who put out that whole thing about recently about a Tiberian pronunciation, knows just when uh, the Jews who were speaking Hebrew shifted from above sounding like a W to sounding like a V, correct? He, he's basically pinpointing when it happened. But he recommends, so you pronounce a vav like a V most times, except, you know, in the times when they're still pronouncing it properly like a W. So he has this contradiction there already. Whereas everybody who knows Hebrew diktuk knows that if you're really trying to get back to the way it was pronounced once upon a time, the vav is a W sound. And that, that, that's fairly obvious to anybody who studies these things. So, uh, yeah, we're all, we're all trying to get back to something. Um, the, it's clear that our system of vowelization reflects a pronunciation that was mostly kept uh, by Ashkenazic Jews. Of course, things were lost. You know, uh, Going to Eastern Europe really messed up a lot of vowels. And it's, uh, it's uh, fairly clear why it is that uh, the Ashkenazim were pronouncing their consonants the way they do, why a tet disappeared, why a chet disappeared. Chet was already disappearing earlier in, in Chazal's times, you know, and even in, in Arabic, you know, chet is sometimes pronounced as a chaf. Perhaps even chet, that's what they say, that the chet in words like Rachel and Yericho was actually pronounced like a, like would they like we're still pronouncing it like a chaf today. It was already, those were the first words to go. Yeah, that's why it's Jericho and, and Rachel and even old transliterations, there's a ch there and not an h. So already things were happening, okay? There was no, Hebrew was never static, but I think some, some pronunciations are, are better than others, but whatever, that's my opinion. I like Seboleth. Seboleth, okay. And, I'll come uh, back to you, go with that. Yeah, it's a, that's, that's a very good question. The, because we can't, our positive tradition, record tradition basically goes back to the Masoretes. So we try to at least go back to whatever the Masoretes are trying to go for. Going farther back is unfortunately not attested to in any real trend, uh, in any real recorded tradition. It's like Torah Shabbat Al Peh. How do we know it's a Torah Shabbat Al Peh? Because at a certain point, they're, they're writing it down. The Ramam says they always take notes. But eventually, Rabbi Udanasi gave us, uh, I guess, an official, an authorized version of the Torah Shabbat Al Peh with regards to the Halacha. So we can't say that, oh, before Mishnaic times, the Halacha was this and that. And we should go back to that. You're not allowed to do that. We have a tradition in Chazal. Things have already been ruled on. You know, uh, like uh, there was a, just recently Gavriel showed me, I was on Shabbos. He said, pointed something out. He says, you know, there's an argument here that Birkota Mitzvah are post-temple. Even though you could find in Tosef that they talk about Birkota Mitzvah all the time. Birkota Mitzvah do, are never mentioned explicitly in the Mishnah. You could always touch it. They're in Gulumar all the time. They're mentioned in the, in the Tosefta. They must be a later rabbinic enactment. That's one of the claims this uh, this gentleman. I have the I have the actually the whole art the whole paper here. It's like eighty something pages long. It's up on my computer. Hold on, there's someone else waiting. Uh, okay, hold on. We have a chat here. Okay, welcome, Josh. And um, basically, it's of later vintage. So that's a strange thing. If someone say, you know what, I want to go back to the way things were before they instituted Birkota Mitzvah. It was just Birkota Shevach, Birkota Anin other brachas, but, you know, uh, uh, go back to that. You, you can't do that. You have to follow what the sages said. So with regards to our pronunciation, at least of the Bible, we have a received tradition that has been written down. Yes, it postdates Chazal, but Chazal, we're already talking about, you know, Korean Ketiv and, you know, the different pronunciations of certain words and different uh, Tiamim on certain words, right? Things have already been determined. Yeah, there were later Machlokatim, there were uh, later disputes, arguments about these matters, but certain things have already been there. So when we're trying to pronounce the way things were, we're we basically try to mimic the Masoretic tradition because that's what's been recorded, and that's what we received. Hope that answers that question. Okay, let's begin with uh, what we have to say today. There was someone uh, asking before on the group about uh, the mitzvah of shofar. So we know what Rambam says very clearly about what shofar is for. You know, it's in some sidurim. Here's what you do. Uru yashenim. First, it's a gzeris akasuf. And then you say it has actually a lesson. The Rebbe Archim is a lot about Rosh Hashanah is the day where, you know, the king has to go see his troops. It's basically like they do in more monarchical countries 
like the Queen of England on her birthday. How do they celebrate her birthday back back in England? They have a whole big military parade. You know, that's the whole thing. Everybody has to show up and salute and stuff. It's one big thing. So that's basically the idea around here. If the king is coming to check the troops, so they sound the horn, and all the troops have to line up and you know be evaluated. That's the basic idea behind Rosh Hashanah, the way we understand from Chazal. I'll give him a shell. Kriyat Shema is, well, what is Kriyat Shema? The uh, Declaration of Faith. Kabbalat Olam Lachut Shemayim. Hero Israel, Hero Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. And the first chapter of Kriyat Shema talks about how one has to constantly study the Torah. Bind it to your arms. Write it down in your mezuzahs. That's what the first chapter is about. The second chapter is about the concept of uh, uh, reward and punishment. The consequences. Keeping the Torah gives you the reward. Not keeping the Torah is the punishment. And that's why you have to study Torah constantly. And the third chapter, which apparently added by Chazal, talks about remembering all the commandments constantly, the mitzvah tzitzit, and also remembering the Exodus, the basis for what we do. And then you see that Chazal couched this biblical commandment in a uh, rabbinic commandment. They, they, it, it, it's basically the shell around this biblical commandment. What is it, the rabbinic commandment that accompanies Kriyat Shema? The brachot, before and after. So there's brachot beforehand. The first bracha is basically the bracha of creation. Yotzer HaMeroth. Every day, we basically, we say that we are acknowledging that God, who is the creator of everything, also has, so to speak, renews the creation every day. Now, when you think about that, that's an important point. Why? It's not so clear in the Torah that that's what it says. That's not saying you could, you could read the Torah and say, you could have read the Torah and said, you know, clockmaker's universe, God created, the to- God created the world, and then rested, and now he doesn't get involved in affairs, or maybe he doesn't do anything that needs, perhaps the universe just runs now, like the clock, without his intervention. And by the way, once upon a time, in the classical era, there were major philosophical streams that believe this, Gentile streams, and they might have inf- influenced Jewish streams. So you can understand why it is the sages would have ordained that we recite this blessing every morning before Kriyat Shema, that we uh, affirm that we believe that God renews creation every single day. Very important point that we might miss. The second one is about the Jewish exceptionalism. God has chosen us. We are beloved by God. We are his chosen people. We study the Torah. And there's a connection, an unbreakable, eternal connection between us and God. That's not something you find in Shema necessarily. And you can understand why. Once again, in Chazal's times, in the classical times, there were major streams, especially among Gentiles, that what? Or the Jews are not exceptional, or even rejected Chasvashol. The the people who repudiated, let's say, Jewish exceptionalism, that was Maccabean times. That was what the Misyavnim and their Yivanim, who were, who were trying to persecute the Jews, basically believed. You know, there's nothing special about Judaism. You should try to be assimilation, etc. And then uh, a few hundred years later, you have the early Christians who were basically usurping the Jewish people's uh, chosenness. You know, we're, we're there, the Christians are now the chosen one. They replace the replacement theology we mentioned last week in, in passing. So you understand why these brachas are now. The third bracha, Baal Yisrael, is talking about the past, how God, because he loves us and because we keep the, the Torah, etc., has redeemed us throughout history and will redeem us in the future. And at night, there's another bracha about guarding, but basically the night brachas are along similar themes, but a little bit shorter, but it's basically the same thing. So now, let me re- review. The mitzvah of Kriyat Shema, the Doraisa mitzvah, is couched in this rabbinic affirmation also. The rabbi is attached more to say to Shema. And that's also important theological uh, theological points that have to be made and Jews have to affirm. So too with the shofar. The shofar on its most basic level is, let's say, as the Rambam and other Rishonim describe, it's a wake up. Uh, there's uh, the 10 Kavanas of Rabbeinu Sadia Gon, right? You can see it. They put in the Machsers and everything. The shofar reminds you of this, or reminds you of that, Harsinai, etc. I like the article has it in nice in English right before the sounding of the shofar. They publish it in, in these in these uh, for in these uh, kuntrasim beforehand, it's wonderful, and that is the shofar itself. But what do the sages do with the shofar? The sound of the shofar they also couched in in, in uh, brachot. What is that? The malpios sechronos and shofros. I remember speaking to Rabbi Barachim a few years about this a few years ago. Uh, it says in the Rishami basically that the sounding of the shofar was done earlier in the morning. 
it was attached to Shachris, not Musaf. You guys heard of that? Okay, it used to be, and you know why they stopped, apparently. This is in the Byzantine era. In the Byzantine era, they stopped. Why? Because they, you know, when, when do Jews dab in Shmon Esrei? It's uh, Vasikin, just at sunrise. So that means before sunrise, they're already gathering in the synagogues. And it seems that on Rosh Hashanah, there wasn't this whole Chazar Sashat, the silent Shmon and Chazar Sashats. Often, it was just the shots, the Shliach Sibur saying the whole thing out loud for everybody because they didn't have Machzorim. The text of the prayers with Balchiel Zechonos and Shofros is most people don't know it by heart. Do you know it by heart? So I, I've been Shliach Sibur a few years now, so I, maybe I could, I don't, I don't feel confident to know it by heart, but I'm saying it out loud uh, multiple times every year. So it's kind of hard. It's not, it's not like the weekday Shmon Esri, or even just the, 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 the Shmon Esri of a regular holiday. So it was already there saying Malchiel Zechonos and Shofros in the morning with their sounding the shofar, right, you know, right at, at, at sunrise, basically. And uh, they were attacked. Basically, the Byzantine occupiers, that was the Eastern Roman Empire, after, you know, switched to the East. Don't, don't forget that also early Christianity. They fell on the Jews. You know, they attacked them. So they realized, okay, so we'll, we'll defer the sounding of the shofar to Musaf. What did it look like? How did, how did exactly their shachris look? When did they say the brach on sounding the shofar back in the day? In the old system before they instituted that we sound the shofar after Shachris the first time, and then as part of Musaf. Okay, up in the air. Should we go back to the way it was done? I would argue so. Okay, well, it's kind of hard. Well, yeah, no, but same thing with the Valet Sion. The Valet Sion is normally in Shachar and Shachari. Yeah. Now it's uh, in Mintan Shabbat. And okay. There's a reason for that. It's the same reason. They didn't want us to say... Uh, the, to, to say because it said it means that, that we're, we're, we're yeah so you can understand we, we're trying to go back to things but to what extent should we go back either way let's let's assume things are the way they are Malchios, Sechronos, and Shofros are connected to according to Rabbi Akiva and this is the thing I sent into the group you notice Rabbi Akiva is connecting three central korbanos of the high ho- of the of the regalim to the sounding of the shofar these are all a sacrifice sacrificial rituals that the sectarians back in the day repudiated. The first is the Omer on uh, Cholomoy Pesach. According to the, the Karaite reading, which follows the, let's say, the Sadducee reading, back in the day, the Omer isn't, isn't on Passover specifically. It's on the Mokharat Shabbat. It's on a certain Sunday, apparently after Passover. So, the, like Chazal said, when they used to do this reaping of the Omer on Motzei Pesach, the, first, the, the second night of Pesach, when we start counting the Omer, they did a whole ritual to show that we are not doing like those Sadducees. The Sadducees would deny this. Say, so just talk about how there was a holiday. You know, it's in Mag- uh, Megillus Tinus. The Sadducees used to impose their way of understanding the counting of the Omer on the Jewish people. Why? Because the counting of Omer also affects what? If they count the Omer after we count the Omer, it's not in sync. It means their holiday of Shavuot will also not coincide with ours. Their Shavuot was always on a Sunday which means that they felt that the bringing of the Lechem Bikurim, the special sacrifice of Shavuot, was also done not when we say it should be done. And then there was Nisuch Hamayim. They totally deny Nisuch Hamayim. That's the offering of, of Sukkot. They deny that. And Rabbi Akiva says, and by the way, God says, sound the shofar and say Malchios, Sechronos, and Shofros for this point. You know that since ancient times, the sectarians have denied Rosh Hashanah. Yeah, that's a surprise. What do you mean? It says uh, on the first of Tishrei, the first of the seventh month is Yom Teruah, Yom Zichron Teruah. So as the sages point out, it's not so clear, it's not Mukrach, that when it says Teruah, it means the Teruah of the Shofar. It could just mean screaming or crying out. Yeah, and which is what the Karaites to this day say. So the fact that the Jews sounded the Shofar specifically as a commandment, remember Shofar was saying they did all the time, it says, Remember, they did trumpets were, were a more common thing. Oh, jo- two Joshes. Oh, okay. Um, you could wash a mozi. We, there's still some pizza. It's nice and hot. Okay, and also when, when you're done, unplug the blech there. You see it's uh, in there. So uh, th- this is something that the Sadducees still deny. Uh, the Karaites still deny that Rosh Hashanah is what we say it is, as a day of judgment, etc. So you see Rabbi Akiva is lumping all these things that the sectarians deny and uh, we, we don't deny, and we're affirming them. And that's why we say Malchios, Sechronos, and Shofros is basically our scouring the written record, the corpus of, uh, of the Torah, for biblical proofs 
as to what we say Rosh Hashanah is all about. So yes, there's the basic level of sounding the shofar according to the Torah. And there's also a rabbinic level of affirming all these other beliefs. Remember, the shofar is about belief in God. It's like uh, Kriyashma squared. But even more so. Okay. So what the sages gave us is just like Kriyat Shema is surrounded by other affirmations of faith, that God continues the creation of the world every single day, renew, renews the creation, that God loves the Jewish people and they are exceptional, and that God has redeemed us and will redeem us, which are all things that the, the groups were denying back then. So too, when we say on the shofar, we also tack on, by the way, we believe this day is about uh, God's coronation, accepting him as king. We believe that today is the day when all people are judged. That's what Zichronot is about. That you could you could easily say, I, I read I read the Bible, like a Sadducee or a Karaite, and I don't see that there. The Christians certainly, they have taken control of our, not control, they've taken uh, possession of our scriptures. They've usurped it and tried to read their own nonsense into scripture, and they don't see this. And the significance of the Shofar Oath also, what does the Shofar accomplish is something that we describe in our prayers. So uh, that's that's basically how we understand what we're supposed to do. So I hope this will improve your prayers on Rosh Hashanah. Here's the books, and uh, let's do it. Where where did we leave off last time? We'll compare what Rambam says over here. I already put the the Hilchot um, Klei Mikdash on the screen over here. Sorry about that, Josh. And uh, yeah, it's quite good. We were talking about the the anointing oil, right? Where is the anointing oil? Last week we said it was good that it was hidden specifically so it doesn't fall into the hands of these other groups, right? I think it was a good thing. And so, too, the Ark of the Covenant was also hidden. Uh, so we met, we left off with this whole idea of what shape. This is something that's not clear from Chazal. Uh, what's the symbol or what's the shape of the oil smear that the one anointing the high priest does? By the way, who would anoint the high priest? I understand it says a few times, like, the Novi anoints the king. Sometimes it was the high priest anointed the king because he's the one who has access to the to anointing oil. But who anointed the high priest? This goes back to saying that, that Tosfos points out there in, in Zvachim that it's not just anybody can put on Big Day Kahuna and become Kohen Gadol. Remember it says that a Kohen Hedyo, how does he become Kohen Gadol? He, when he doesn't have anointing oil, he puts on the Big Day Kahuna, the Kohen Gadol's outfit. Does that automatically make him Kohen Gadol? Because there's another halacha that says, no, just because a Kohen wears the Kohen Gadol's outfit, he performs a service, he might actually disqualify the service because he's not Kohen Gadol, he's wearing too many garments. So the... Uh, Yeah, so it has to be someone appointed by the Beit Din of Kwanim or the other Kwanim themselves. It can't just be any Kohen who runs and puts on the Kohen Gadol outfit and presto, he's a Kohen Gadol. So too, it can't be that, oh, this one Kohen, the Kohen Gadol just died. So this one Kohen is going to rush, grab the, the, the Shem and Amishka and start pouring it on his own head and turn himself into Kohen Gadol. It doesn't work that way. That's a sin. Okay. It has to be the one who is fit to be Kohen Gadol. How you decide that? So the other Kohanim decide that. There's actually rules of heredity. There's hereditary rules. If it's the Kohen Gadol's son is the first one to get the job, if he is qualified. If he's not qualified, so it passes to the next qualified individual. The point is, you can't just put on someone's head. The question was here, that the Rambam says, they do put on his head. My question was, it doesn't say explicitly who's the one who's pouring it on the Kohen Gadol's head. Apparently someone has the authority to do so. Either way, what's the shape? It says, uh, it makes it like a C. And that's the closest one you could read that in the Rambam because that's what the Rambam's own handwriting has. It looks like the shape of a C. Except there's other arguments to mean like an X shape or a K shape. K and X are similar in shape, by the way. And it's very clear the co that the king basically had a crown all around his head. It doesn't have to say it looks like a summit or a mem or, a, uh, sorry, or uh, the Latin O. But there you go. Uh, so we're up to the 10th halach over here. No saying of Shemana Mishcha. No, oh, sorry, it's over here. I'm, I have the wrong thing on the screen. There we go. Oh, it's not working. There you go. It says here, Hanotem Yishem Neshchal Gabe Melech O Kohen Gadol Shekvar Nim Shechu Patur. Person using the anointing oil on a king or a high priest who have already been anointed. So he's exempt for the sin of using the oil inappropriately. Why? Shnemar Vasher Yitenu Yimenu Alzar. The person to be punished is the one who puts it on a stranger, stranger to the oil. 
Vain elus arim et lo. And these people are no strangers to the anointing oil. They're the ones who deserve it. It's the king and it's the high priest. So just adding more oil is not such a grave sin that it warrants a punishment. Or, or to obtain brochure, hazot means this. Limshoch means to pour it on the head. He just pours as enough as he needs. Lasuch means to rub some on the skin. Let's say put some on his own. Okay? So that, that's the problem. Chayav. So a person is chayav for doing such a thing. He's liable. Shnemar al besar adam lo yisach. It says in the Pasuk, it shall not be spread or it shouldn't be rubbed on anybody's flesh. Kol adam b'mashma. Any person, even the people who should have the anointing oil on them. By the way, what they do after, let's say they poured it on the coin goggle's head. Eventually he's going to go to mikvah. Eventually he's going to wash his hair. So basically it washes off. The point is it happened to him once. It's not like it stays forever. There's a midrash that says that with Aharon, what happened? It stayed as two beads in his beard. Some say it implies that Aharon had like one of those split beards. Okay, So it stays forever. Let's say the coin goggle has just been anointed. It's all on his hair and it's on his head. So he reaches up and takes some and he uh, rubs it on his on his belly button. See, he rubs it on his stomach over here. That's what it says. Chayav karet v'hu sheshesuch mimenu b'chazayit. As long as he's taken a zayit worth, which is a very small amount. How much we saw in the back, we said, according to Makbili now, three to five cc. It takes a little bit less, so he's not liable. But a coin gadol shouldn't even do that. Shouldn't even rub some from his head onto the rest of his body. Now, this is a Rambam over here that's a little bit, uh, it's a machlokas, or I guess it's inexact. We're going to compare it to what the Rambam says in Hilchus Melachim. Here he says, Ein moshkina tamelech ela al gabe mayon. We do not anoint a king unless it's on uh, next to the, the spring. Over here, let's switch over to Hilchot Melachim Melachamot. I'll read over here. Uh, it says here, Kishe moshkin malchi beit David, ein moshkinotan ela al hamayon. When we anoint Davidic kings, we only do it on the Mayan. Nafkamino, like uh, the last non-Davidic king to be anointed was Yehu, right? Did Elisha make sure to bring him, uh, tell his messenger, bring him to a uh, spring to anoint him? Or he just said, just bring him cheder betoch cheder. He did it in secrecy. So you could say, so what, what is it, Rambam? Is it Malchi based David or any king who's to be anointed? And the answer I would offer is, once upon a time, it was any king. But once David was anointed, they're the only ones who may be anointed. That's what Rambam's going to say. They're the only ones who are now qualified to ever be anointed in the future. Shaul was anointed with the anointing oil because back then, anybody who was God's chosen king was to be anointed with the proper oil. But once King David got it, future kings of Israel, that is non-Davidic kings, when they're anointed, they're not anointed with the real deal, Shem and Amishra, so they have no din of being anointed on the Mayan. So what we have here is the original halakha. Uh, we have in, in our book in front of us was the original halakha. The king is to only be anointed on the fountain, uh, next to the, sorry, next to the spring. And once David shows up, now it's strictly re- reserved for his seed. What Lama davar domeh, like we said before, sitting in the Azara. Eli was the Kohen Gadol at the time. He was sitting in the Azara. Says he was, he was sitting there at the entrance to the Heichal, which is then the Mishkan Shiloh. How is he sitting there? He's just a regular quiz. The king, yes, he was the ruler of the Jewish people at the time. And we saw also, we're going to see this uh, also in Hilchot Melachim. The Rambam says very clearly, Yoshua was a melech. Oh, you know, in, in what way? He was the leader of the Jews at the time. He, he was not anointed. He did not have a crown. He did not have a hereditary position. But he was the king at the time. He was in lieu of a king. So Eli had this privilege. And I guess if Gidon or even Yiftach had shown up at the Mishkan, Previously, they would also have had the right to sit in the Azara. But once David earned this right to be, you know, keep the kingship in his family, now it's a specifically Davidic right to sit in the Azara. Okay, back to the halachot here. The Ein Moshchin Melech Ben Melech. Technically speaking, we do not uh, have to, or we should not, anoint the Melech Ben Melech. So, by the way, now let's compare this to the previous halacha. The Melech ben Melech doesn't need to be uh, anointed. Why? The kingship is hereditary. As long as they're qualified, it keeps it stays in the family. So the, the, the king's son does not need to be anointed. This is in contradistinction to a high priest, son of a high priest. 
every high priest, even if it stays in their family for 20 something generations, like it did for, let's say, Tzadok, each one is to be anointed on his own and for seven days. The king gets one anointing. And if his father had been anointed or his grandfather, it's already, it already counts for him forever. So the question is, we just saw that the coin gadol or the melech, someone pours more anointing on their head. He is, he's not liable to excision for doing so. Let's say it's a king who's already third generation king. His great grandfather had been anointed with the oil. If someone were to now put oil for no reason, anointing oil on this king's head, there's no dispute. There's no reason to anoint him in the middle of his reign. Would the one pouring the oil be Chayav Karet? Because this fellow is technically a czar to the anointing oil? Or because is the, the anointing that they did for his great-grandfather counts as his anointing, then if someone were to pour more oil on this king's head, he would, would technically be exempt from punishment from doing so. I don't know. I'd like to see some insight. I don't know the answer to this question. Uh, yeah, they did. So we're going to get to that. That's the next line of the Rambam. And the Gemara talks. The Rambam is going to quote the Gemara here now. There's some sort of controversy going on. Who should be king? We anoint him in order to end the, you know, stop all the discussion. Just to show this guy is the king. None of this succession divide up the Satmar Hasidus between the two different sons of the Rebbe which is, by the way, to take seriously, they patterned it after this, that it's a hereditary thing. It happened in Second Temple times, before, Mac before Greek times, but after the death of Shimon Atzadik, you guys heard about Beis Chonia, we mentioned it before, the Temple of Onias, which stood in Heliopolis in Egypt until basically the Second Beis Hamikdash was destroyed. Why was that built? Who built it? A renegade Kohen. There was a dispute among Shimon Atzadik's descendants, who gets to be Kohen Gadol? And there's two different versions about who was wrong in this matter, who was, who was the tzaddik involved. Be that as it may, there was a dispute who gets to be coin gadol. There was no dispute about the oil because the Shem Nishko already didn't exist. It was already hidden at that point. We understand sometimes there is even a machloket who gets to be high priest. So this is the type of way of saying, okay, we're going to end this all for now. The one who's anointed, that's it. They basically had, I think there was disputes about who gets to be Rebbe and the one who basically had the Rebbe's, the former Rebbe's to fill in it shows that he's the one who's the, he's the Yorish. Why? Because he has the Rebbe's tefillin, the one who gets the tefillin, something like that. There was a, there was such a thing. Okay. So uh, this is what they do. Technically speaking, Solomon did not need to be anointed. Why did they anoint him? Because right then and there, he had a brother who even before David died and even after David died, still had designs on the throne. Okay. Adonia had a good claim. He says, yeah, he had, he had an endorsement of another high priest. He had the general on his side. He had a lot of Amisra on his side. That was a good claim. He was older. There was a good reason why, you know, he would have thought that he has the right to do it. And also, he did all these things to show that, look, I'm basically already succeeding my father. And it says that King David didn't do anything to stop him. He never told him, excuse me, what are you doing? Right? That's the beginning, right at the beginning of the Book of Kings. Okay. The Yoash Mipatni Atalya. That was your question. What? No, she was she was she was de facto ruling. Yeah, but what's what's her what's her claim as, as... former king's wife, former king's uh, mother? She's in charge. Perhaps she, I, she has the power in her hands, but that doesn't mean yeah, her... that's a machloket. I'll tell you why. And this is an important thing that we have to read between the lines. Perhaps, and this is a strange thing, Ahab, from a political perspective, mm -hmm. had been good for the tribes of Israel. He was, according to the secular history, and he's the one we dig up the most, he's the most attested to in the, even the archaeological record, which is only incomplete because the farther back you go, it's going to be less, less complete. He was a dominant force at the time. The Jews were doing well at his time. Yes, there was idolatry. That's in the eyes of God. The prophets could say, yeah, all this prosperity and all that, and your military might, your conquests, it's good for the Am Yisrael and even good for the, the, the Jews who are not under your rule. The, the, he finally made peace. Ahab finally made peace with Yehuda and Binyamin. That was a good thing. That, that, that was a great thing. And he was a good leader. Yeah, so he had a religious problem. To us, religious problem is the greatest problem. So I would imagine that Atalia, his daughter, the way she ruled in Yehuda, in the wake of what appeared to everybody to be a major tragedy, her son being killed in a coup up north, 
at a young age. And the whole upper kingdom, the, the northern kingdom being thrown into turmoil, basically, in the first few years of his reign while Yehu's coup was going on. It's not like Yehu managed to wipe out Ahab's house in one day. It took some time. So there suddenly was turmoil up north. And the prosperity that had existed for the previous 30 years continued in the land of Yehuda. They credited it to Atalia. To them, she was a decent ruler. She was from a ruling house. She had experience. Like I said, she was the previous king's first, the first, the, the previous king's mother, and the king before that, his wife. And basically, yes, maybe it says that she was counseling them to do evil in the eyes of God. But that doesn't mean that the people weren't enjoying themselves. They probably liked her. She might have had quite some popularity. We don't know. We don't know about all the kings who succeeded Yeruvam. Uh The the Navi just tells us, did they continue Yeruvam's policy of no pilgrimage to the temple? I would imagine that Nadav, Yeruvam's son who took over for him, was radically different in whatever he was doing from Basha, who assassinated him. Basha had a popular assassination. The people didn't have a reprisal against Basha. He seemed to have, it seems that whatever Yeruvam and his sons were doing were unpopular, and he wasn't actually an efficient king. Whereas the Basha regime was popular. Why? Because when Basha's son was assassinated, needed and usurped the people did rise up and say no we want to continue the current regime we'll make his number two king instead not the assassin that was omri that was Ahab's father so the people i i would believe kind of like this regime and they liked atalia for what she was so she had supporters that's why that's why it mattered that's why she had a claim to the throne and that's why it mattered that yehoyada who put yoash on the throne remember you're dealing with a six-year-old how much das does a six-year-old have? This was basically a Kohanic coup. It, you could imagine that it was quite dangerous. And the Kohanim aren't necessarily warriors. They're not the most fighting people, although they are the most fighting. In one way that they are, Shevet Levi are, the, are God's strongest, most valiant, most vigilant. And that's why God put them in charge of the Mikdash. But if you put them to war, they could be stronger than Yehuda and, and God. But they're not used to this. So this was a very, very uh, tumultuous time in our history. And that's why you can understand why it is they, they specifically anointed him, even though there's no male who, who could be a, a rival, a claimant, a pretender, whatever it may be. It's his own grandmother. But because of her, they had to anoint her. Well, she is a woman, so. Yeah, I, was making, I was making the point uh, because uh, she's not. The, the second uh, temple times, what was the best time during the second temples? It was when uh, there was basically Shlom Siyon Malka. Yanai was dead. He wasn't the best guy. He went off the derrick even more than his father. But she allowed her brother to basically be his prime, her, her prime minister. And as I'll say, that's when things were going good. You know, the water, the rain came within, and the, the land was blessed, and they even stored some for the future, just like Moshe Rabbeinu stored the month to show people. See, this is the miracle. He says, if you keep the Torah, this is exactly what God said. Yeah, so it's we. I don't think it was a reserve for everybody. The point was, yeah, a, a queen could do well. Remember, queen is bidiavad, uh, but queen is a queen. You know, just like the Ram says, a lot of people aren't. We're going to see this later when we get to the final chapter, the end of uh, Malachim and Milchamot. We're going to see that lichat chila. There, of course, it should be a way, but if you get someone who's not a Davidian, then it's a problem. You know, but whatever it is what it is, and if you get a woman, there's a mitzvah. It should be a man, but if it's a woman. Okay, so you go with it. If it's if it's Niviyah, you go with it. If you have to ask Chuldah Niviyah a question, your meal is not around, so that's what you have. Yeah, it's a very good question, by the way. What are they talking about there? Yoshiyahu died, and Yehoiakim was apparently older than Yehoiachaz. Yoshiyahu, unfortunately, had three sons who, who ruled after him. Three sons and one grandson. Yehoiachaz... And then he was taken away quite quickly after that. Yehoiakim, who was around for at least a decade. Yehoiakim's son, Yehoiakim, who lasted three months. And then Yoshiyahu's third son, one of his sons, the youngest son to rule, was uh, Tzidkiyahu. And uh, hold on. So apparently the people liked Yehoiakaz better. It says the Amha'aretz were the ones who appointed Yehoiakaz to be king after Yoshiyahu. Yoshiyahu died in battle at Megiddo. And... Yehoiakim, we know from the from the Tanakh, he was not a nice fellow. He was a he was a Russia. So you can understand why it is that the people preferred 
Yehoachaz to Yehoyakim. Next. Um, it's inexact here. Elisha sent a young Navi, it says, one of his Talmidim, to, there's, according to Chazal, it's Yonah, because, once again, uh, personality parsimony. What's parsimony means uh, trying to keep things, trying to keep the number of personalities mentioned in the Torah to a smaller amount. So whenever you have someone mentioned anonymously, you try to identify him with someone who's explicitly around from that time. And Yonah fits the time frame. He would have been a student of Elisha at the time. So it must be Yonah was the one who, who was assigned this, this uh, matter. Okay? But Elisha himself did not actually pour the oil on Yehu's head. Not only that, who had been given the commandment to anoint Yehu? Yeah. Eliyahu. So why didn't Eliyahu do it? And then Elisha passed it on to another Navi. Apparently, so I'd like to say that perhaps they did this out of fear. Even Eliyahu himself, he was sort of fearless, but God protected him from being killed. How did God protect him? It's like Ovadia said to Eliyahu, I had to hide a hundred Nevi'im. You know, life and death. We're, we're in, a, we're in a, a religious war here, and just surviving is a hard thing. But how do I know, Eliyahu, a Navi, that you're not going to just disappear on me again? Don't you do that whole Eli Navi thing? God, the Ruach Hashem, is just going to pick you up and take you somewhere else, and you're going to disappear for another three years. Because even what Eli Navi is described in all the stories of Eli Navi, appearing and dis- reappearing and disappearing. He was already known to do that, even yet, even when he was still mortal. That's what Avadia tells him. I'm not, I, I, you better stick around because if you pull another disappearing act, it's going to be, that's quite normal for you. So Elionavi apparently did not feel, even though he pronounced the prophecy against Achav in, in Yehud's face, Yehud said eventually, don't you remember when Elionavi said this Nebuah that we'd eventually kill Izevel this way? Elionavi himself never actually anointed Yehud. Instead, he passed it to his Talmud. Who passed it to his Talmud? It must have been out of the fear. Right? You can't just do things. Even you're going to say, oh, the Navi was afraid to anoint a rival? And the answer is yes. Who was the first one who was given a difficult assignment like this and had to do it in secrecy? Samuel, Shmo Navi, was told, you know what? That king you anointed, he's rejected. By the way, what, what would have bothered Shmuel so much about rejecting Shaul? It made Shmuel look bad. Shmuel announced the people... I'm, your, I'm the Navi. On God's authority, I've anointed this man to be your king. To come back a few years later and say, God has reneged on the deal. This man has been rejected. I'm revoking his kingship. Navim are not supposed to revoke that which they say in God's name. It looks bad. Wait, he, but he already told a, sh- a show long before any of this. That your Malchus right? will not last. Yeah, and that, that, well, was, just, huh. and that was just because it's like, oh, you didn't wait another three hours. But that, that was not a public declaration. That was between him and Shaul. And... Shot Miz is that he will not have a long dynasty, but not that God has rejected him. He says, Okay, that means that means you have been rejected yourself. This the Bechira has been removed. We described what Bechira means. So Shaul was upset, that's why he cried out to God all night long because it made him look really bad. It's a Hashem to do such a thing. And then he says, I have to anoint this new fellow that's dangerous for me. How am I going to do that? I can't anoint another another king in this king's lifetime. That's a dangerous thing. So you can understand why it is that Eliyahu Anavi himself did not anoint Yehu. And Elisha himself didn't even anoint Yehu. He left it for, you know, an anonymous student of theirs to go do in secrecy. Okay. But eventually the word got out. Just like Shmuel Navi anointed David apparently in secrecy, eventually he had to tell his Talmidim, Koamar Hashem, I have anointed David to be king. And that's why you see in that book, once David is a fugitive, people come to him, his own brother-in-law and wife, and other people come to him and says, God has said that you are to be king. Why? Because there has been an announcement from Shmuel Navi's own base medrash that, you know, he can't, he's, Navi's not allowed to keep the, the message secret. Mm-hmm. By the way, there's a, there's a, it's forbidden for a Navi to keep his message secret. So the first people to know about Dov, what happened to David Amel obviously were his father and brothers. But eventually, word got out, and it says, by the way, when David became a refugee, even though his brothers had originally, his older brothers had been drafted. You get an idea of how young David Melch was when he killed Goliath from the fact that even his older brothers, remember, he was the youngest, he had older brothers who had yet to be drafted. So, obviously, David was not of draftable age, but eventually he became a warrior for Saul, and eventually he also had to run for his life. And it says he was hanging out in Maratha Dulam and places like that, and who's it says who joined him originally? Originally, he was on his own. But who came to join him? His family, his father and his brothers, and then his whole mishpacha came, and everybody who had a grievance or felt like they were they were in danger for whatever it is, 
And David Amalek's own brothers eventually became his biggest followers. Interesting enough. They originally said, who are you to, you know, why, why are you coming out to see the war? And eventually they, they, they were his tagalongs. Okay, back into the text. Yehu did not, uh, was not anointed with the anointing oil. It was Shemina Farsimon by parsimony. I said, uh, parsimony or parsimons is not this. A farsimon is something else. It's not parsimons. You can't get oil from parsimons. You know what parsimon is? Yeah. Okay. It's a type of fruit. Yeah. So you don't get oil from that. It's like, it's not a peach. It's more like an orange tomato with a, with a tough thing on top. And it's sweeter inside. Ooh, I, I, for some reason, I don't like them. I never got used to them. That's not this referring to here. It's referring to uh, Acajalinsa densis. Oh, um, Giladensis. Some sort of uh, Giladensis is one of these herbs. It's a type of tree. It's a very woody thing where you could derive oil from it. That's what he used. Okay. Yeah, it's also mentioned in the back. So we anointed him with that. Okay. So th this is uh this is Masora that they did. It's not explicit in the in the in the Bible that this is what Elisha's student used. It's uh, a tradition that because I'll say that people like Yehu were post-Davidic and Malchai Yisrael were anointed with parsimon oil by the prophets. It's also important to note that Yeravam himself, who was appointed by Achiyah Shiloni, was never anointed. Okay? Yeravam, the main, the one who was, who was given a chance to be like David Melech, was never anointed. It doesn't say that also. First, it was uh, Achiyah Shiloni met him and, and announced him, one day you will be king of these ten tribes. And then it says the ten tribes made him king. But it doesn't say that they had their convocation and, anoint, and they anointed him. David was anointed three times. What? David was anointed three times? Yes, David was anointed three times. The first time was by Samuel. The second time was when he came out of hiding and he became king of Yehuda. And it says that the, the people of Yehuda came and anointed him as king for their tribe. And then he became king of all Israel. It says, once again, there's a kingdom and all Israel came and anointed him. And that was uh, according to the word of God through Samuel. Samuel had been dead for a few years. No, they finally said, you know what? We'll do what the Navi said. Why? Once again, God tells you, he, cho he chooses something. He says the Navi, through the Navi, this is the man to be king. It doesn't mean he's going to be king automatically. The people can say, we don't want this guy. And it happened to both Shaul and David that even though they had heard it from the Navi's mouth that this man is meant to be king, they didn't take the step of actually making him king. It's a very difficult thing to do that. And nowadays we have the same problem. Nowadays it's very clear God has already told us that we are to have a Davidian be our king. We are to find the best man from those families, the best man qualified. We do not have to anoint him, but we have to make him as our king. And every time we appoint a ruler who is not qualified for whatever reason, because he's not from the right family or because he's not kosher, call the homer if he's not both, then we are not fulfilling this commandment which is why I'll be happy to vote. There's an upcoming election. If there's a proper Davidian who wants to be prime minister and he has the right qualifications, then I will vote for him because that's a mitzvah. Other than that, I don't see, you know, voting for all these other characters, what, 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 is, what does it accomplish? You know, we're getting, we're getting very jaded here. So if you know of a, a proper Davidian who, who wants the job, then uh, he has my vote. Okay. Cool. What? He's a Davidian? Okay. He wants to run. Is he kosher? Does he promise to keep the Torah? Is part of the, is building the base of Mikdash on his party platform? Okay. So, Kol Kleam Mikdash Asam Moshe Bamidbar Lo Nit Kachu Ela Bimshi Chatan B'Shem Namishcha Lav Dafka Moses. Moses didn't actually make the Kalim. He was the one in charge. Is, did B'Tzala make every single Kli? Did uh, did uh, Ohaliav make every single Kli? No, it says they had a whole staff. It says, Kol ish but they're the ones in charge. The point is, that which they used in the, in the tabernacle was anointed by, by Moses. And that's what made them sanctified. Everything part, even the tabernacle itself had been anointed. All its kelim, all its components, the Ark of the Covenant, all were anointed. And the Kwanim were all anointed, by the way. Shnemar vayim shachem shotam. It says in Bamidbar, it also, he could have quoted from Shmos also, that it says they were all anointed. However, there's no commandment, even in the first temple times, to anoint any part of the temple, any, any the temple itself, or any of the kelim in the temple. What makes them sanctified? The fact that they're used once in the service. 
So what's the first kli that they use in the service? Ironically, not a knife. A shechita knife does not necessarily have to be a sanctified vessel of the temple. You can bring your own shechita knife as long as it's tahor, and that's what they used to do. People who brought Korm Pesach, they brought their own knives. You have to make sure it's just like a person who comes into the temple, they ask him, have you been through the process of, you know, the paraduma water, have you been to mikvah, etc.? So too, they look at this knife. A knife is metal. Can it contract even death impurity? Have you properly uh, decontaminated this knife? But what is the first kli that has to be holy that's used in the temple? By the way, and the, the fact that it's not holy is attested to by the fact that a knife, a shechita knife, can be wielded by, technically speaking, even a woman. Whereas the first kli that's sanctified during the temple service, during the stage of the temple service, is who's a kohen around here? Levi. Okay, but no, they don't count. You can't do this either. Um, well, yeah, so the, the cup for the blood. There has to be a kohen holding the cup for the blood had a handle also. So that, that is a sanctified vessel. So what makes it sanctified? The kohen used it once to catch the blood. And he then walks the blood over to the altar and applies the blood to the altar, however the, the, is prescribed by the Torah. That's what makes it sanctified. Is it, is it what? used in the service in a proper way? Because by, uh, by Korach, the 250, yeah. the pans became sanctified through that. Oh, good question. The, see, there were not Kohanim. Zarim had put a Torah on there. But apparently they had taken fire. They had taken the coals from off the altar. So because they held altar coals, which are sanctified pieces, sorry, there's Me'ila with those coals, so too, that was what sanctified them, even if the person doing it was not supposed to have done it. Mm. That's apparently. But then again, that's the, that's the Mishkan. So maybe it is that when they brought those into, they brought those in, they anointed them also. And they're saying, we're about to use these in the temple. So the Kohanim said, well, they're going to remain in temple service now. So at least anoint them because Moses himself told them, take some pans. Maybe they were, you know, maybe they had been anointed also or previously because they, the, they knew Moshe Rabbeinu had told them, you use Ketoris and if God chooses you, you'll be chosen. Either way, those pans were going to be staying in the temple, so they might have been anointed. Good question. Very good question. So make notes of these for the YouTube videos. If anybody has any answers or has any insights, please send it along. It says, Shnemar Asher Yishar Tu Vam Bakodesh. They would use, they would serve with these in the Kodesh, that's in the temple. It's through the goose in the temple that they are sanctified. Okay. We're going to scroll down now. That's a very good question. Next. These are uh, ladles, bowls, where they receive the meal offerings. Meal offerings consist of flour, grain. Those cups in which they receive the blood. And all the other service vessels. They were all of gold and silver. Did they use bronze in the temple? Yes, but not necessarily for these things. If they're poor, so you could use inferior metals, bronze, even iron, if you have to. Don't forget, they didn't have that, that much uh, choice then. They had basically had, they had tin, iron, lead. That was the other, the other choices are just an alloy thereof. But really, have, it's not really a normal thing that people mix, let's say, lead and iron. There's no real lead iron alloy that they were using back in the day, even then. You could technically do it. It doesn't come out good. You know, it's brittle. It's it's useless. Okay, and you don't mix tin and and uh, and iron and, and lead. They're too far apart from the periodic table to be useful in any way, right? Yeah, it does. Yeah, and nowadays they put in carbon. You make steels. You know, but you don't. You, they didn't mix mix these metals. But technically speaking, you could use these metals in the temple. and they all become sanctified through their use in the temple. Let's say they broke. So you melt them down, make a new kli out of them. The important point is that their sanctity never leaves them. So even if they're melted down, they're broken, you can't say, okay, just throw, throw it out. They had to use a tin vessel in the temple once. And now they've gotten richer. They're not going to save, the, the temple doesn't really save a tin vessel. Well, they melt it down. Maybe they could go to the temple treasurer, they could redeem it, but the point is, you don't just get rid of a kli. You don't fix it. You melt it down and make a new kli. That's what he's going to say now. They've been pierced. They have a crack in them. Don't patch them up. Melt them down. Make new kalim out of their, out of their material. 
by the way, uh, silver and gold have relatively low melting points, right? The, the, the precious metals. Sakin shenishmat min hanitzav, ocean if gone. Let's say you had a slaughter knife, temple slaughter knife has come out of its uh, handle, right? It's owned by the temple. And, or it's, it has a nick in it. They can't really fix the blade. How they make knives back in the day, by the way? Nowadays, how do we make knives? What's the process of sharpening steel to make a knife? You basically have a, a, a wheel spinning really fast. And the metal basically goes, well, yeah, you have to place it at a certain angle and it basically scratches off. It makes sparks fly. That's how you make a nice steel blade of the, uh, the edge of the blade, right? So let's say you have this blade. It's no longer worth it. Don't take this temple owned knife and stick it back into a new handle or sharpen it. There's a special room to the south of the Heichal between the Kodesh and the Ulam, La de Rome. You show you on a map, it's basically in the in the, the the west side. If you'd walk into the first room of the temple, which was always open to the air, so it's on the on the west side. By the way, this is like uh, this is like those scalpel blades. They have single use scalpel blades. You ever see them? Anybody doing any dissections, surgery, Mila? No. I have a few in my house. So they they basically have there's two things the Moalim have. Either they get a nice proper ismail as they call it, which is uh, a larger knife. It is it's double sided and sharp, and they sharpen themselves. They keep it good, or they just use surgical scalpels and surgical scalpels are basically a razor blade that comes in a, a, a handle. The handle is permanent. And every time you do something, you replace the blade to keep it you know, sterile. And it comes in a sterile cover, each one. So they're quite cheap. They're disposable blades. So this is all the same thing with the, the, the knives that they had in the temple that were owned by the temple. So they weren't fixing them. They were just, you know, they weren't melting down them for their steel. They would just put them away in these Okay, once it's, once it's broken, it's not used anymore. We don't skimp in the temple. We don't have to melt down the old blades or resharpen the old blades. We just put them in Geniza and, and get new ones. Okay. There were two uh, measures, dry measure, there in the temple. Well, what do we what do we use for uh, what do we use for dry measure? What do we what are we measuring? Well, minachot basically. Isaron vachatzias isaron. How much is uh, Isaron? Isaron is a Shir Chala, which is about, uh, according to the things in the back, 2.6, uh, 2.16 liters. Okay. And Isaron, 2.16 liters. What's half of 2.16? 1.08 liters. Ha Isaron la Menachot. This Isaron was used for Menachot. The most basic is, uh, Mincha is an Isaron, a flower. Vachatzi Isaron la Chalok bo Mincha Kwingadol Shebechol Yom. The Kohen Gadol would bring a mincha every day. What's that? It's minchat chavitim. Similar to a minchat chinuch of a Kohen the first time he works, but the Kohen Gadol has to bring this whole korban every single day. Half the morning, half the in the afternoon. So if he's one isaron of flour, it has to be divided. So you need the measure of half an isaron. Make sense? Good. V'sheva midot shalach sham. And also for measuring liquids. By the way, what's the difference? The major difference between measuring uh, dry and measuring liquid dry sometimes it's not exact you can you can put something in a let's say i'm using this to measure flour as i'll say you can have also it could overflow on the top it makes basically a pyramid you know it's conical yeah level no i'm just saying you could you, you could do that that's dry measure liquid measure is exactly in the cup nothing goes above the meniscus basically basically and if you overflow it'll overflow okay that's that's what they have here so that's the difference between lock in there there's a heen Ahin uh, is basically 3.6 liters. Lachatsi hahin, 1.8 liters. Ushli shitahin, 1.2 liters. Well, we having this, well, we have a hin. Rivi tahin. Okay. And then there's a shli shitahin. Chatsi hahin. Depending on the size of the of the animal being offered. Rivi tahin is the next one. How much is Rivi tahin about in liters? 0 0.9. 900 ml of what are they measuring with heen? They're measuring wine, wine uh, and oil. There's a log. Log is a third of that. Log is a third of Ravius, which would be about 300 ml. Vachatsi log. So that would be 150 ml or so. Uraviit. And a Ravi'it of the log is the one we're familiar with. So 
a half of, of 150 is 75 ml. So you see these things uh, keep recurring. 75 ml or so is Rabbi Rabinovich's estimation and also other Rambam uh, scholars, which is why when, you, when it comes time for Kiddush and uh, saying a blessing on the wine, let's say uh, on Passover, you don't need such a large amount of wine. That's basically what it seems here. Okay. What do we use? and When they bring a slaughtered sacrifice, an animal sacrifice, you have to know how much wine to bring. Okay. The log Use a log. Remember, a log is uh, we said here 300 ml. Tell how much oil for the the grain offerings. Chatsi log, 300 ml of oil, is basically how much was in each lamp of the menorah. 300 ml, it's quite a lot. So the menorah used quite a lot of oil every single day. When they make the individual chavitin, they're making the, 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 the portions of this meal offering, they need the revi'it, 75 ml, to show you how much to put in each portion. Technically speaking, there's nothing in the temple that they needed a whole team for. Okay? So why they have it? It says, we read earlier, had Moses make the Shemen of Mishcha, he took a whole heen of oil. So you see that that was uh, basically, how much is that? We just said a heen was uh, 3.6 liters of anointing oil was made originally. And quite a lot was used for the Mishkan. And every subsequent coin gadol was anointed seven times. And certain kings had been anointed once. So I don't know. How much do you think is left? Yeah, I wonder, I wonder how much was actually hidden, you know? How much do you use? So it says just enough. I'm not supposed to use uh, too, too much extra. Okay? So I, I wonder, or is it... Often they say, Chazal say, it's a miracle at last that so much lasted. You know? Okay. I don't know. It would be interesting to find out. I'd, I'd imagine if it's such a small amount that's left. Someone was saying uh, earlier on the WhatsApp group, I said, they, they, there's a story out there, apocryphal story, maybe Rav Gorin saw the Ark of the Covenant because he had access. He went into those passages under the Temple Mount during the Six-Day War when everybody was euphoric and he finally had access. I think it's actually quite a possibility. There's nothing magical about finding the Ark of the Covenant. There's a reason why it's hidden. And it's not the smartest thing to touch, you know. And I'd imagine also that it's not just exposed, just like the Jews were commanded to cover it up when they moved it. Why would it be, you know, just sitting there? You know, it's probably hidden well, and even there it's covered up. It's not the type of thing you should be looking at, you know. It's not, it's, it's not going to be like Indiana Jones style that it'll strike down whoever gazes upon it. You know, that's not how it works. You're not supposed to look at it out of respect for God. But it's not like, you know, like they used to tell us, uh, you guys grew up with this, they said, don't look at the Kohanim's hands when they're dochening, and that's why they cover their hands, because you go blind if you do it. Anybody hear such a thing? That's above a Misa. The Kohanim used to not cover their hands. And they cover their hands so as not to embarrass people who might have, you know, things on their hands. It used to be that the Kohanim works with red paint all the time. So we can't get it off every day. So he has red hands, he's going to do this. So nowadays we cover it, and we don't look. But in the olden days, it wasn't such a big deal. It's, but... I thought there's a, 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 a statement. I think maybe in like the Gemara. I'm not. I'm not yeah. confident about, about this at all. But yeah. like it says that like the Yeah. Okay. But it doesn't mean you're going to go blind. It means you should show, show respect and not just be staring at them. But it's not like you're going to be harmed by doing so. Like we saw before, they don't, they go into the holy place. Not supposed to walk in there. Not supposed to gaze upon it. Not because there's some magical force that's there that's going to strike you down. It's that it's not respectful. You know. It's like whatever that means. Right. Okay, the the angels the cried into his eyes. You take these things too literally, you're going to become, uh, I guess, foolish. I don't know. You shouldn't, or you're already too foolish, and that's why you take it literally. Well, well yeah. Can't look at his own hands. I don't. I recall that. I know that some people. It's not common today because the the Kohanim the wear their tallits over their face. And but their hands stick out. Okay. The uh, Chazal never talked about the Rambam doesn't talk about covering the hands at all or covering the face. There's no this tallest thing. I know some. This is a good thing. There were some Ashkenazic young men came to Eretz Yisrael, 
and they, they're koanim, so they have to duchen every day. So they adopted the practice of just getting, you know, they'll have a talus anyways all the time. Why? Because they have to duchen every day. So because they created this minog that the kohanim always have a talus every single day, these kohan, these young men were zochet to actually keep the mitzvah of talus every single day. You know, uh, I thought it was a, it's a good thing. I uh, I make sure to buy bar mitzvah. The best gift you can give bar mitzvah boy is a talus because even if he's going to be like, oh, I traditional Ashkenazic, wait for until I get married. Tell him you'll have it so that in case you 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 leave the service or in case you're whatever you're you're reading the Torah, whatever purpose you have it available, and it'll make him more active in the service. It'll give him more excuse to wearing the talus, and that will make him more active in the service. And it's a uh, you know it'll, it'll it'll have positive reinforcement. I remember buying one for a recent bar mitzvah boy. And I was actually quite surprised to show that his father had already gotten him one. His father himself had had a talus from his own bar mitzvah, even though he never really wore it all the time. And he had his son already wearing it from well before the bar mitzvah. So it was an upgrade. So I think it was a good idea. So the, good thing you were thinking the same. I got my son already two talisim. Why? Because it gets him excited about Daphne. Yeah. He's not bar mitzvah. He's, he's, he's not Sephardic, you know, but it's still, it's a good thing to have and it gets him excited. So yeah, talus is, is a good thing. Mitzvahs, if you get kids excited about mitzvahs, it, it'll, it'll, it'll last them. They already have an advantage. Let's continue. The chatzi log, they use to measure the water to give to the straying woman and also the oil for the Thanksgiving offering. The revi'it, they used also to measure water uh, measure oil for the Lechem Nazir. The, the Nazir also brought a special grain offering at the end of his service. And also water to purify the Mitzorah. His final stage of purification, he has to go to the temple and use a Mechusar Kapara until that point. So there's water involved in the service. This is a, a, something interesting here. It's not the Masim that they do this, measuring the, the, the oil and the water for these for the Lechem Nazir or for the for the Mitzorah. He says, the Malacha that they did in the Mikdash is what did it. There's a note over here. Kedushah klea sharet sh'nesta ayde ha-shimush b'chilim ha-mikdash, nesta b'klea medida ayde ha-shimush ha-ikari shalahem. Okay? These two things, they, they didn't sanctify. It's when they use these, these kalim for something that's more temple involved. Or actually holding the sacrificial foods, for example. Okay? These are, these are considered all additional services. So, Measuring the oil for the Nazir's bread and measuring the water for Taurus and Mitzorah, those are not sacrificial uses. They became, these Kalim became sanctified for temple use through some other action. Oh, wait, but now they're sanctified. You could technically use them in the temple also for these purposes. It's not, not a contradiction. That's more of the Kiddush. All these uh, measurements of Kodesh and Kleisharet. The, what, the, the cups we mentioned before, they had been anointed in Moses' time. They had been anointed within and without, on the inside and on the outside. The things we saw measuring for the flower, the halacha tetzayin, those were only anointed inside. What's the Beirut say? It means the overflow. Things that fall out, the, over, the ones that fall out on the side, of the Midot Alach, which had been anointed also on the outsides. So those things that fall out of them are also Kodesh. Uve would say Midot Yavesh Chol, and that which falls out the side of these Midot Yavesh, these dry measures, they are not sanctified. Very interesting. Right, that's uh, also Gemara there. So this is a good cutoff point for chapter one. We're now going to go into the Ketorah. Any questions until this point? No? Okay. So, uh, yeah, it's kind of interesting. You could donate to the temple, by the way. People used to donate just the raw materials or actually donate the, the kalim themselves. Mahon Mikdash has made quite a lot of kalim already. Uh, I think that they're smart enough that they didn't say these are officially temple property. Otherwise, there'd be me'ila. But they've said it's property of Mahon Mikdash, and the intention is that one day they will be used in the temple. We would like to encourage our viewers to share these videos with friends and send in your responses. If you would like to obtain Birkon Nusach Eretz Yisrael or invite the rabbi for a speaking engagement, please email us at office at machonchilo.org.